It's nice to see you all. Thank you so much for joining us. I know I expected you all to be home today glued to the TV to find out if, uh, if there was just one shooter in the JFK files. They're, they're releasing those today. So if you, if you hear on Twitter, let me know what's happening. So yeah, Cornola. I had quite a few people ask me if I was going to be presenting on a new crop, but as uh, Lewis blew it, I did find there's a con uh, Cornola product. It's actually corn oil in the States. There's actually a little village of Cornola in Tuscany, Italy. Population seven, beautiful little place. Checked out Facebook and found Cornola. So Cornola does exist, Lewis. Do you know Cornola? And thanks to Megan, she, she did a little Photoshopping. So yeah, that, that's what's coming up. I'm going to talk quickly about the weather. The last uh, three years have been pretty interesting, and, and the two studies that I'm going to talk about, we actually did have locations here in Medicine Hat, and it's been a pretty fun experience learning about planters. It's, it's a pretty different world to me. I'm, I'm more experienced in air seeders and, and direct seeding and such, and so, so getting a taste for what planters can do has been fun. You notice in 20, 2016 in Medicine Hat, we were actually pretty wet, 166% of normal. And heat overall was pretty high except for Lethbridge. 2017, things changed rather dramatically and actually Vauxhall had it the worst, 42% of normal moisture. So for a lot of areas, June 13th, June 14th, it basically stopped raining and it didn't rain again for you know, a good two months. And, th and that certainly had its impacts on, on the crops. Although I think because we had you know, pretty decent moisture last year, our reserves were, were up, the soil profile was wet, and a lot of people managed to pull off reasonable crops. So the dryland corn study, you know, this, this was really stemming along the front that uh, Monsanto, Pioneer, are developing lower and lower heat unit varieties. And grain corn, you know, they have a, a big objectives of, of increasing acres across Western Canada. And we thought, you know, this is kind of an opportunity to do some agronomy work and see how, how can we fit really grain corn into zero tillage in southern Alberta. A good majority of corn production is actually conventional agriculture. They're, they're moving to more zero till, but originally planters were not designed to be zero till implements. So a lot of the experiences that we've had uh, and some of the challenges that we've had are how do we adapt these planters so that they work in a direct seeding uh, position. So we did some basic agronomy, population and spacing. For corn, we did 20 inch row spacing and 30 inch row. 30 is probably a little bit more common, but I spoke with some scientists like Dwayne Beck in South Dakota and he actually predicted the best for us would be 20 inch row spacing at 20,000 kernels per acre. So we wanted to test that and find out for ourselves. We looked at a basic nitrogen fertility study and we looked at a little crop sequencing study. This project was funded by ACIDF and I, I wanted to take a shot out there for ACIDF because it's, it's a program, uh, the Alberta Crop Industry Development Fund, that's come to an end and I'm a little bit concerned about this. Generally speaking, it's, it's a fund that allows us to do research in, in other novel crops and, and, and other areas. So with that fund ending now, how do we study things like hemp and, and dryland grain corn? So I'm, I'm hoping that you know, something along that lines will materialize in the future here. So the Precision Canola Study, that was funded by the CARP program, the Alberta Canola Producers and, and the Canola Council. And I, Appreciate that they took a risk on us. Um, this is, is, it's not something that's really widespread across Western Canada yet using planters, but I see more and more people are interested in it. And after I show you our results, i am show you why I'm a little excited about the potential. With that, they asked that we also looked at seed placed phosphorus. And because we're playing with row spacings and a lot of guys are, are going a little bit wider rows than we typically do, as you have a wider row, the concentration of phosphorus actually goes up. So uh, we, we, we need to have a better handle for 
how much phosphorus we can put down with the seed. So it was really meant to be a seed safety study. For those of you that don't know about planters, they use a vacuum instead of air. And you'll see that plate with the corn. It basically sucks air through there and really does a precise job of individually taking a, a seed and placing it in the ground. So, so that's one of the big benefits. It's also on a parallel length system. It, it, uh, it does a fantastic job following the contours of the soil. So to go with, into canola, we just switch to a smaller plate. And you'll see that the, the seeds are nicely um, sucked onto the little holes. And then it's, it's incredibly precision as far as, as the distance between seeds. And when, when you study corn and, and they're pushing, you know, three and 400 bushels an acre, every little minute detail about how you distribute that seed across the field has an impact in yield. And I think we're starting to see that that's the same case with canola. You can basically plant anything with this. So we, we actually put some demo plots out where we were planting wheat as well. So I'm not gonna talk about that, but basically uh, these planters can be set up to, to seed just about any crop. The one that we use is in blue is, is soon to be green. Monosem is a French manufacturer and uh, John Deere bought them out this last year. And I've, I've heard rumors as well to be on the lookout for a more field scale planter set up for our type of agriculture. So I think the equipment guys are, are, are paying attention to this. The problem with them now is a lot of times are, farmers are using their planters, that, the ones that they used for, for their beans or for sugar beets, and they're not set up for, for fertility and, and residue management and things like that. So it, word on the street is, is watch out for field-based um, planters that are, that are more suited for, for small grains on, on broad acres. Okay, so this is a, a shot of one of the studies where we had the 20-inch rows and the 30-inch rows, and, our, and we varied our population from 15,000. And in, a, in the planter world, we actually talk about seeds per acre as opposed to you know, bushels per acre. So we went from 15,000 seeds per acre all the way up to 35,000, and, and just that, simple change in orientation of the plants had a really dramatic effect on, on plant growth. And you can kind of just see visually this plot compared to this plot, big differences. And then you'll watch for the optimum spacing. They also talk about the, the distance between seeds. And I haven't got my head quite wrapped around that lingo yet, but the, the hardcore farmers will talk about you know, what plates and what seeding rates will give you a, the, the proper spacing between seeds. So this is our, our results to date, and over three years we had eight trials so far. And Dwayne was right on the, the row spacing. The 20 inch row spacing is out yielding in blue bars, the 30 inch rows, rather significantly. Um, however, it seems so far that the increased seeding rate is still giving a positive response. So, it's good news for seed people who sell seed and maybe bad news for you guys, but um, this 20,000 and 20 inch row spacing pr from what we're seeing is not, is not likely optimum. So we went on average a 65 bushel crop to a 76, 77 bushel crop. Now these are all dry land. This is not, uh, not irrigated and you also know that we've had some, some years of drought. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty impressed even with these yields. And it, it, it may not sound a lot for the typical corn grower, but on a dry land farm, uh, a 70 bushel crop of anything is usually pretty positive as long as we can manage our, our seed costs. So, so that's something interesting to keep an eye on. Um, local pioneer folks are ticked off every time I present. For some reason, you know, the, they're anecdotal data, they're, they're always seen over 100 bushels on dry land. So I'm not saying that it's possible, but whenever you take a study and you look at averages, it tends to lower, lower things. So we, we had locations in Lethbridge, Bow Island, Vauxhall, and Medicine Hat with this study over, over a three year period now. So our, our nitrogen fertility one is one that's got me baffled more than anything. And the results here are why I'm confused. This is actually eight studies as well. And we've basically got no response to nitrogen in any of the locations. So 
I mentioned the story before. You may, you may, if you're investing in in this case, and you know, t t take what we show with a grain of salt. Like no, no study is perfect, and every farm has individual uniqueness that you have to consider. But um, corn is actually pretty good at uh, scavenging nitrogen, and in this case, you know, with an average of 70 bushels, literally no response. These numbers right here are the background soil residual nitrogen. So in one case, we had high. 113, but you know the, the spread was, was pretty low for the most part. 13 pounds per acre, 66, 21, 25, 17, 16, and 66 over the eight sites, and, and very little nitrogen response. We also played around with some split applications of liquid fertilizer partway through the season, and there's a potential response here, but it's pretty minimal uh, in all honesty. So kind of interesting results. Not sure what to take of it. When looking at crop sequences, we basically just grew a bunch of different crops before corn and then grew corn into it. And it was also interesting in that um, we did a zero tillage component uh, in a block treatment and we did a, 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 con a conventional treatment. So basically we would have gone in and cultivated the area and then planted the corn. So this is, this is kind of a neat aerial shot that shows some of the experiences that we've had. And there's no doubt the planters work better when there's some tillage. And that doesn't mean that they can't be adapted to work better in, in no-till, but you can see the evenness of emergence in all of the precursor crops, soybeans, wheat, lentils, canola, corn, peas, mustard, just got a wonderful job of, of, of a really even stand. The no-till, created some issues, but at the same time, we didn't stop and adjust the planter for the different types of residue. So, so those are some of the modifications that we're gonna be doing. So self-leveling residue cleaners is one that we'll be putting on this next year. But you can see even, you can see visually that corn stubble there caused a problem. And the precursor crops with the least amount of residue, and that's it's a little bit hard to see, um, they, the planter did just a fine job. So soybeans, lentils look pretty nice, peas look pretty nice. The mustard and canola, we visually saw issues with, and that's because they're non-mycorrhizal crops. And corn actually, despite the fact that we put liquid phosphorus with the seed, it was really having a hard time scavenging phosphorus early on, and, and the plants were, were stunted and purple. Here's a, an overshot of the entire trial in Lathbridge a little bit later in the season. So even though early in the season we saw a great even stand under the conventional, drought came on this year. So you can see this, is, this block right here was zero till. Some of the plots look really nice and even and some of them you can see there's really big spots missing. So this is likely the corn residue here. Uh, wheat residue was actually fairly thick as well. And then you'd have a nice, uh, a nice even stand under peas or lentils. And then this block right here was conventional. Very even all the way, but you can actually notice that there's, there's a, a much more greenness right here. That one pass of cultivation beforehand made such a tremendous difference in the overall crop as the, as the season went on and it was all to do with moisture. So not only did we lose the moisture at, at, the, at the time of seeding, we were losing more moisture throughout the season because of the lack of residue and, and higher evapotranspiration. So that was pretty cool to see. We walked in there and the zero-till plants were at least a foot taller. The cobs were noticeably thicker. So I think it is important that we, are, we figure out how to adapt these planters a little bit more to deal with the residue of the precursor crops. And the results that we saw, this line here is actually the plant stand. So plant stands were nice and uniform across the conventional treatments. And then they kind of get a little janky here across our no-till. So in corn, our plant population was actually quite low. However, it still managed to yield quite well. So corn on corn, you, you hear about it in the States, it, it, it does work well. And uh, it's just one of those, those weird things. You'll notice yields depressed a little bit in the mustards, a little bit in the canola, and again, I think that's that mycorrhizal effect. But generally speaking, 
there's probably more of a more of a story here about how to set planters. And there is just simply a higher level of management with planters and, and a different type of management than we're used to with our air seeders. So I'm gonna switch gears to canola. Does anybody have any quick questions on the corn results that I just presented? Just a quick question about those more the farm. Yeah. Did you see that like in the record when you actually did the field stuff higher? Yes. Yeah, 20, 2016 was a, was a pretty good year as far as moisture is concerned. 2017 drier. Ken, uh, you, your planting rates uh, on your pulver, was that, on the last chart, was that the emerged plant per acre or was that the planted feed? Did I just your population? Yeah, that's counted plant stand. Yeah, and, and you'll notice we're down in the 20,000 range. I didn't mention this, this trial, mostly because Dwayne thought 20,000 would be the best. At the beginning of the study, I decided to plant this study only at 20,000 seeds per acre. So we hit that for the most part, but we dropped below it in, in the residues that uh, the planter had trouble with. So this is the plant population on the right here. Did that answer your question? That is your seeded rate or your emerged or your... Uh... Your actual emerged plants counted after, yeah. Yeah. The target was 20,000. Or sorry, the seeding rate was 20,000. We didn't really have a target. We just chose 20,000 seeding rate. So on the canola front, we wanted to look at row spacing as well. And in this case, we thought we'd go for that 20 inch range. 22 is the, I think what a lot of guys use on beans. 20 worked better for our matching our tractor tires. And I wanted to do something a little bit different because nobody's really gone to the narrow rows. We had demoed canola um, with a planter at, and I think the Ag Tech Center, not the Ag Tech Center, the Irrigation Demo Farm planted some as well. And I wasn't really too excited about that wide row spacing in canola and it really never did canopy over. So I thought, why don't we just uh, crunch this up and try 12 inch row spacing as well. And we compared that to our, our typical air seeder and here, in our case, we had pillar lasers that are on 10 inch row spacing. And Mike put this picture together, and it really is one of those ones that a picture says a thousand words. Along the left here was our air seeder plots. And this wasn't the way they were arranged, but we, we put them side by side. The monosem on 12 inch and the monosem on 20. And the seeding rates that we went with on this front was a range. We went from 20 seeds per meter squared, 40, 60, 80, and 160. That's a, a geometric rate that helps give us more power in the stats and generating curves. And I was kind of actually a little surprised. The seed weight that we had, I think, was 4.7 grams per thousand kernels. And we calculated that out. So the range we actually tested was 0.8 pounds per acre, 1.7, 2.5, 3.3, and 6.6. .6. And you can sort of see the differences between the planter and the air seeder, especially at the lower rates. And this is why with the air seeder, we've never really been able to, to get much lower than three or four pounds per acre. And you can see the canopy closure is pretty nice up here with an air seeder. So this is, you know, somewhere in this range is, is why we seed canola where we do. When you look at the, the 12 inch planter though, we've, we've got pretty reasonable, you know, compare this one to this one, we're able to get the same canopy closure um, at a much lower seeding rate. And that's mostly because we're doing a better job with the planting and we're having less plants die. So our percent emergence is improving. You'll notice on the 20s, even at the highest seeding rate, there's still gaps in the row. And that, that was a concern for me. And we never, we never do get that optimum canopy closure. And I think that's the business that we're in is, is trying to have the plant architecture, <clears throat> architecture, that's the one, in a, in a 
position that we're maximizing solar capture by the, the June solstice. And in this case, I think we're sort of missing the boat a little bit on the, on the wider row spacing. So this is our, our percent emergence, and I think a lot of people are always a little disgusted when they find out they're getting 40% survival in canola seed. And, and it really comes down to seeding rate, and it's, it's plant to plant competition. So as we're increasing our seeding rate, the, the percent emergent is just dropping dramatically. So this is the air seeder here. So at, you know, in between, say, four and six pounds per acre, that's exactly what we found. We were in that 30 to 40 percent emergent. So we're, we're basically not really making good use of our seed. As soon as we move over to the planter, we're boosting it, but not quite as much as you might expect. We're, we're kind of getting into that 50 to 60% range around here. And then on the 20s, the problem again, you go to a wider row, you're putting more seeds in that row. So you, we're seeing a slightly less um, improvement in, in emergence, but still, I think overall, our, our job is better with the planter. It's just not, it's not perfect. We never will, I don't think, hit that 70 or 80 or 90% emergence like we do with wheat. Uh, unless we really go to these low rates. So on these really low rates, we're hitting 70% emergence. So that means 70% of your seeds are surviving and, and forming a plant. So this, this slide makes me nervous. The, we have six site years, and it makes me nervous because we've got, you know, I'm, I'm one of these guys, if it's too good to be true, it usually isn't. But we're seeing a pretty amazing yield improvement with the 12-inch monosem. And that's this bar right here versus the air seeder and actually a reduction in the 20. And I think we may have been a little bit unfair with the 20s. I think they could potentially be higher. I'm a little concerned that we're getting a little bit of uh, compaction from the tractor tires on the 20 inch spacing. But you know, we, you hear about people going to planters because they want to save on seed. I think probably I'm more interested in going to planters to do a better job and getting better yields out of the canola. Uh, a higher yield makes so much more of a difference in, in your bottom line than saving a little bit on seed. So the other you know, consideration is, is seeding rates tend to be a bit of an insurance policy as well. I wanted to show the, the two irrigated studies we have. So this is sort of limited data, but um, you know, in, a, in our range from 60 to 70 bushels with our air seeder, at 0.8 pounds per acre on irrigation, we got eight, 78 bushels. That's pretty, pretty incredible, I think. And not really much of a response curve when it comes to increased seeding rates, but you know, something to consider as far as um, really being able to push the envelope. I know the Canola Commission or Canola Council has goals of of increasing average yields and, and maybe planters is one way that they can get there. Yes? I'd tell you, but I'd have to kill you. No, we, we just went with a, with a, a, a fairly popular common, um, in this case, glyphosate tolerant canola. Yeah. We haven't gotten into varieties. We did actually have that in the original proposal and that might be an opportunity moving forward, I, I think there's a chance that there's some different genetic differences in uh, plant structure that may, you know, be better suited for wider rows, say, for example, versus narrow rows, but we haven't looked at that yet. This is sort of a, a preliminary shot looking at, at planters, so it's, it's really only, um, it's between Lethbridge and Medicine Hat, so limited locations. So Mike and Megan put together this slide, and, and I, I, th I find it pretty interesting as well, and it's looking at that space between seeds in the row, and I've made the error bars nice and thick so that you can see them. This is the air seeder. So the wider the um, standard air bar, the more diversity there is in the distance between seeds. So it's, it's almost a measure of how uniform uh, the seed placement is. And Although at the low seeding rates, all of the planters had pretty wide error bars, when you went to the next level of, of seed density, you'll notice that on the monosem, these error bars are much, much smaller. 
And that's basically saying that we're just, we've got a way better distribution of seed. And it, it's, um, it gives each seed the chance to, to survive and not compete with each other. So it's a bit of an explanation as to why we're seeing the results that we are. So I'm going to move on to the seed place phosphorus and I'll just about be done here. This was another surprising thing because the current recommendations for seed place phosphorus is in, in Alberta and, and Saskatchewan is actually pretty low. And so we first started out the study with a range from zero to 40 kgs per hectare of actual phosphorus. Pretty much the same thing as pounds per acre. It's, it's a very close number. And over six sites years, six years of data, we're not seeing any injury. So this is that percent emergence. This study we did seed at a high seeding rate, so about five pounds an acre. And in both, in all cases, this is all three of the planters put together, we are seeing no reduction um, in plant stand until we get to the, higher, the highest fertility rate that we actually added in the second year because the first year we saw no damage at all. So it kind of seemed pointless to to do a study on, on seed place phosphorus and not see uh, a, a point of injury. And, and this was pretty surprising to me, so I'd also consider this preliminary because I don't want to, say, recommend people go out and put a whole schwack load of phosphorus down and then kill their plants, but I, I have the sense that there, there's, a good, there's probably an opportunity for us to perhaps up our recommended rates of phosphorus, and, and I think a another interesting thing that we saw is that we're starting to, we actually saw a positive response to the more phosphorus, and that's not always the case. So this is actually at the field day here in Medicine Hat, and we went along at all the different rates, and we saw no injury, but when we pulled individual plants, the highest rates of phosphorus, you could see a tremendous, way more branching, a much bigger, healthier looking plant. So, we looked at the yield quickly, and I know this is a, a pretty busy chart, so sorry for that. Blue is air drill, um, orange is the monosem, and uh, the gray is the, the 20 inch. So as we move from zero, again, not a lot of response from phosphorus anywhere at all, until we get into these higher ranges, the 40 and the 60 here. So for higher yielding crops, it could be that uh, we're, start, we're, li we're actually limiting our crop more on phosphorus than we are in nitrogen. So that's something I think to keep an eye on, especially for the irrigated folks, is we may, we may need to put more phosphorus down. So this is split between the dryland and irrigated studies. Um, average yields, you know, slight increase again at the 40s, but pretty minimal um, responses to phosphorus in general. And then a reduction at 60. So I think that's just showing that we are hurting the plants at the highest rates. What well, irrigation, we didn't see the injury, probably better moisture at the time of seeding and better moisture in general improves seed safety. But what's got me kind of interested here is, is the bump that we're getting up at the 60 kg per hectare range. Any questions on any of that? So then just some final thoughts on this. Generally, I'm pretty excited about planters and its potential for expanded use in southern Alberta. I think it's, uh, it's just a better way of managing our crops. And I think seeding is, is the most important uh, thing that we do. It's, it's about setting up the crop for, for success throughout the, the entire growing season. Um, I'd look out for, for, for the manufacturers coming up with planters now that are, are more suited, that have air carts and and can, can cover the, the large acres. But at the same time, you can get a small planter for, for not too expensive. Even that little four row monosem we bought, it was, it, you know, it, it can sideband nitrogen, it can do liquid foss with the seed. Um, they, it wasn't much more than $20,000. $20, so, you know, that's, that's something a guy could even just get one and play around on smaller acres. Learn uh, the intricacies with planters as they are different. And uh, I think, you know, we do need a little bit more work in, in adapting them so that they can do a better job of dealing with residue. So self-leveling -le um, residue cleaners, a little bit more down pressure, and they can come with different setups that will, will work 
better in different scenarios, and, and even just the skills and setting them properly. Uh, basically, if, if we're considering reducing seeding rates in canola, it, it can be done a lot, I think, more safely without reducing or without compromising the risk management of a, of a good seeding rate. What I'm excited about is the potential for higher yields. So uh, that's, that's sort of a new one. I'm not, uh, I'd like to see some, some more field scale studies. I know some guys are out there on 15 inch row spacing with canola. Um, I think that's probably a really good compromise. I'm not seeing an issue with higher phosphorus rates so far. So that's something to consider. Uh, it looks like we're, we are getting higher yields with the narrower rows, so, so that's also something to consider. We have a pretty, pretty short, fast growing season here, so uh, I think that narrower row spacing just gets us to that point where we're, we're really intercepting as much sun as possible. And on the, uh, on the highest canola yields, so whether that's in areas that have more rain or under irrigation, I think we should be looking at pumping our, our phosphorus rates up. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody that helped put this presentation together and the whole crew. We had a lot of fun this year. I hope that it's not two years of dry in a row um, so we can continue our work. And if there's any final questions, I'd be happy to answer them. At the back there? That's a 1034 liquid. Yeah. Actual, yeah. All right, thank you.